so we can see. Uh, but uh, for an infrared telescope like James Webb, you don't want to be doing that because as you circle round around the Earth, you would go in and out and in and out of the Earth's shadow and you would heat and cool and heat and cool. And that's a nightmare for an infrared telescope. So you want to be somewhere far away where you're thermally stable. So James Webb is out here, again, very much not to scale. Um, it's about one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth, somewhere that we call L2. It's this nice stable point in the solar system. So it actually orbits the sun rather than the Earth and it keeps pace with the Earth. So there's a, ESA released this video to show you. So as Earth orbits the sun, this is the moon going around it, James Webb keeps pace and basically just sits behind the Earth. And it orbits round L2. So L2 is this point of stability in the solar system. James Webb actually orbits around L2. So a James Webb's point of view, so the solar system sort of looks like this. And it can keep its uh, sun shade pointed towards the sun. If I go back to the image of uh, James Webb. Uh, this bit is the actual telescope, right? This is the mirror and the, all the instruments. This uh, stuff here, this is the, sort of origami construction, is the sunshade. And they point this towards the sun that keeps this side uh, really nice and cold. And because it's outer L2, um, it means uh, it's, it can be very nice and thermally stable, which is exactly what you want for this kind of telescope. Um, that also made it a very terrifying thing for astronomers, though, because anyone that uh, remembers the Hubble Space Telescope launching in the 90s will remember that it didn't go according to plan, right? So when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, it didn't work very well. And uh, the first images came back very blurry and unfocused, and it took an astronaut servicing mission. They had to go up there with a shuttle to fix Hubble, and Hubble has been tinkered with and upgraded over the decades. Uh, this isn't possible with James Webb. It's one and a half million kilometers away, so it had to work first time, or it was $10 billion worth of space junk. And so, but like I said, it, it worked first time, and so everyone was very happy. Um, so just to sort of explain what you'll be seeing in these images, um, it is seeing a different part of the spectrum compared to Hubble. So Hubble images the sky with the light we can see more or less. So it's, Hubble is a visible instrument and it sort of just squeaks into the ultraviolet and the infrared. So it does some very near infrared stuff and some very sort of near ultraviolet stuff. Uh, com by comparison, James Webb sees way, way, way into the infrared. So it's seeing a completely different view of the universe than uh, anything we have seen before um, with Hubble. So it's seeing completely new things. Um, it, it will be able to see colder things, so cold stars and cold gas and cold dust. Um, it can also see through things. Infrared light is very good for seeing through obscuring material. So parts of the universe that were sort of behind veils for Hubble will become sort of crystal clear for James Webb uh, in ways that are quite remarkable. Okay, moment you've all been waiting for. So I, there, there were several images released. I, I'm going to, I, I will show, I'll, I'm going to show you all the images and sort of zoom in on some pretty picture things. I think I'll probably leave a, more of a deep dive into the science for our two speakers, for Emma and Madhu. Um, so I'll just, I'll give you sort of an overview of the images that were released. So this is the first one. This is the one that was released uh, last night. Uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris uh, did a live stream and released this. So this is a view um, of a, a cluster of galaxies that is uh, maybe three or four billion light years away. So these sort of these uh, white ones you see in the middle here are some very massive galaxies, three or four billion light years away. And these sort of hall of mirrors you see here of these streaks and arcs are very, very distant galaxies indeed. These are galaxies looking more than 10 billion years back in time. And they are being, the light from these things is being stretched and warped and magnified. Uh, by these massive galaxies in the foreground. It's something called gravitational lensing. And if we zoom in here, we can kind of can take a pan across this uh, picture and, and see what we're looking at. Uh, the most remarkable thing about this picture is that almost everything here is a galaxy. Like this big bright thing is a star, right? But everything without spikes is a galaxy. There are thousands and thousands of galaxies in this image alone. And for reference, this image, the, the, the whole image as I showed you before, covers the same uh, amount of sky as a grain of sand held at arm's length on your finger. Right? So imagine how much sky that covers. Then there are thousands of galaxies in this image. Um, I think the most spectacular thing for me comes when you compare this to what Hubble saw. Um, so by coincidence, Hubble has imaged the same patch of sky. And so this is uh, this is a part of that picture as it was uh, when Hubble saw it. Um, so up to James Webb, up to yesterday, this was the best view of this part of the sky we've ever seen. And then this is James Webb's version of it. <laughs> it's, it's almost like it's like putting on glasses, right? Um, so, but, but and I think the thing, thing I want to point out is the existing galaxies 
you can see much, much better, but you can also see entirely new galaxies. All these, so every single, every single thing you see here is a galaxy. All these faint little dots you see here are galaxies, uh, billions and billions and billions of light years away, and they were completely invisible in the Hubble. Uh, we're just we're seeing it in, in just entirely new things that we've never seen before. I think this is the most striking one for me. This is the same patch of sky again observed uh, with Hubble and James Webb. You know, and think think about it. Hubble is the most revolutionary astronomy instrument instrument ever made. Right? It's uh, more papers have been published with Hubble than any other instruments. And James Webb just sort of completely leaves it in the dirt in a way that completely blows my mind. Um, this one image, um, that, you know, that one sort of wide, deep field, there are hundreds of scientific papers uh, just from that waiting to be written, I'm sure. And I have no doubt that the most distant galaxies of all are waiting in that picture. Almost certainly there are galaxies more than 13 billion years in the past sort of hiding in this picture. This is going to be one of them. So this is a, this is a Hubble image. And then do the same thing again, switch to what James Webb sees. And of course, it's much clearer. What, what I really want to point out is this bit here. You see, there's a galaxy here, which is very red, and just doesn't exist at all in the James Webb image. So this is a galaxy that's so distant, its light is being stretched by the expansion of the universe until it's very, very red. And it's so red that Hubble can't see it at all. So this is a galaxy that was completely invisible until James Webb switched on. And yeah, this, this, this is only the first. This is just the type of thing that we'll be seeing. Like James, one of James Webb's mission statements was to look at our cosmic origins. Um, and it really is doing that in an amazing way. Okay, image number two. Uh, this is, uh, I, I, I find it really hard to pick a favorite. Every time I see one, it's my favorite. Um, so this is the Ring Nebula, um, again, seen in this infrared light. So uh, when we've seen this before, all of this detail is obscured. Uh, so what James Webb is doing is sort of almost using, I was going to say X-ray specs, but it's not, it's not X-rays, right? It's infrared, but it's looking through the material um, to see things. And if, again, if you zoom into this image, the detail is unbelievable. It's also being photobombed by some galaxies. There is a galaxy here, edge on, and there is a spiral galaxy here. Can you see? You know, we, we never knew there are galaxies, uh, <laughs> the galaxies in the Ring Nebula. And if you kind of move, just pan the image around, you can see uh, just the, the, the details and the, the fine structure and the filaments and stuff. Again, we just would never have seen before. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so, th so this is the near infrared image from James Webb. If we switch to a sort of a further infrared image, um, it looks like this. Uh, so this is going really down up to about sort of 20 microns or so. So very, very red infrared light. And what this reveals is that the star at the center of this uh, nebula is a binary. So you can actually see these two dots here are the two binary stars that are, that are causing this nebula. So I think people had suspected that there was a binary star in the center here, but they had, never actually knew for sure. So yes, yeah, so now we know there's, there's a binary star in the center of this. Okay, next image. Uh, this is Stefan's Quintet of Galaxies. And so this, it sort of look, it almost looks Photoshopped, right? It kind of looks slightly ridiculous. Um, but this is over here, but this is, this is not Photoshop, this is real, this is just straight from the universe itself, these five interacting galaxies, and what we're seeing here is just so much detail about uh, where we've seen dust, and so, so what we're actually seeing here is hot dust which is surrounding new stars being made, um, so we're, we're picking up uh, these sort of uh, new stars. If you kind of zoom in, you can see just all this absolutely gorgeous structure. Like there's, you know, there's years and years and years of work uh, to be done, like unpicking just any one of these images. Um, we can do the same trick here as we did for the Ring Nebula and go to these longer infrared wavelengths and show you this one. So this is the same picture as before, this quintet of interacting galaxies seen in very long infrared wavelengths. And the most remarkable thing here, what I want to point out, is that at the top here, you can see this sort of spiky thing because it look, looks very bright. It looked, almost looks like the stars from the first image. Um, this is actually a, a black hole. Um, it's a black hole that is actively sort of eating material, sort of gobbling up material and sort of throwing out loads of energy. And it's so bright in the infrared, it's sort of, we get these diffraction spikes from it. Um, and again, yeah, this is something that's it's absolutely incredible. Okay, the last thing I I'm going to show you before I hand over uh, to, uh, to uh, Emma to give you more of an in-depth talk about James Webb and galaxies is, I think, my favourite picture. Um, it's a photo of the Carina uh, Nebula, and uh, it looks like this. this <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, right? <laughs> 
and just the the level of detail that we can see in this is I I it, it is jaw dropping honestly. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. There's so much texture to this thing. Um, you can see these like folds and and rivers and uh, these there's all kinds of complex stuff going on. This is I don't know. I've, 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 I saw this about two hours ago, and I think I don't think I've quite picked my jaw off the floor yet. It's, <laughs> Um, it's pretty remarkable. And I think the most amazing thing that is that this is only the beginning, right? All of these images came from about five days of James Webb's operations, and we've got 20 years ahead of us. Um, you know, we are just sort of, it's not even the tip of the iceberg, right? So it's, uh, we have an enormous amount to go. This is just a, a little sneak preview of the amazing things that we're going to be doing in the future. I can't wait. Now I'm going to see um, if we have um, a, a headline speaker for you. Bear with me. Uh, we do, now just a moment. Uh, okay, Emma, can you, oh no, HDMI 8, there we go. Uh, okay, Emma, hi, welcome, if you unmute yourself. Hello. Wonderful. Well, hello. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. So everyone, this is Dr. Emma Curtis-Lake. She is a web fellow at the University of Hertfordshire and an expert in galaxy evolution and uh, is going to tell us all about how James Webb is going to revolutionize our view of galaxies. So uh, yes, over to you, Emma. Amazing. I shall share my screen. I'm so sad I can't see you all. This is uh, one frustrating thing of not being there in person, um, actually. Let's do that better. I want you to be able to hear the sound as well. So, I'm going to trust that uh, Matt now has just tell you all the things that you need to know about web, um, as he promised he would do. And I'm going to be telling you about how we're going to use this as a time machine. So you may have heard that rather a lot. Um, in fact, all telescopes are time machines. It's not like we've built a special one, um, but we'll be able to uh, look back in time. So our eyes are sensitive to visible light and we pick out different colors. But if our eyes were sensitive to the infrared, the way that Webb is sensitive to the infrared, we'd be picking out different temperatures. So it really gives us different information about the things that we want to learn about. And that's one reason um, why it's so exciting to be getting these uh, data, the infrared data. It's just extra information. But why did we go to so much trouble to build this huge telescope, fold it up, put it into a rocket and go into outer space just to look at the infrared wavelengths? And the first answer to that is we had to send it to space because the Earth's atmosphere gets in the way of all the infrared light. It can't make it to the ground. So although it would be lovely to make a huge mirror on the ground, it'd be much easier. We'd have a huge collection bucket for photons, etc. cetera. Um, we just wouldn't get the light. And then we also see very different things in the infrared. So we can peer through dust. These are three different views of our very own galaxy. And this one down here is looking to into the center of the galaxy. And it's the view you might get if you're lucky enough to be in Australia and look straight into the center of our galaxy and up into a uh, dark sky. And what you see are you see these dark features here. That's not a lack of stars. I mean, the closer you get to the center of our galaxy, the more stars there are. It's just that dust gets in the way and it's obscured in the optical. But if we go to the near infrared, we can peer through it and we can see all the stars behind it. And if we go even further into the infrared, we actually start to see the dust itself shining. So we get very different information and very different views of what's going on. So that's helpful for us if we want to look at stellar birth and stellar death, which uh, we've seen some beautiful images of today, and I hope that you get to explore them in Cambridge. But the other reason why looking into the infrared is amazing is that we get to probe the history of the universe. We get to look back in time. And to explain that, that takes a little bit of a setup. So I'm going to take you through it a little bit slowly. First, 
uh, amazing but simple fact is that light has a finite speed. So this video shows you in real time how long it takes light to travel from the moon to the Earth. It takes around 1.255 seconds. And so actually we see the moon around 1.255 seconds ago. You may know it takes around seven minutes for light to travel from the sun to the Earth. So we see the sun as it was around seven minutes ago. And the further away something is, the longer it takes the light to travel to us and the longer, further back in time we have to see it. But that doesn't tell us why we need to go into the infrared, does it? So the next part of the puzzle of why the infrared is needed was provided to us around 100 years ago by Edwin Hubble. So this is the man that the Hubble Space Telescope was named after. And he measured the distances and speeds of galaxies and found that the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. So that's not like we're sitting in a special part of space where everything's moving away from us. Everything is moving away from everything as the universe expands. It's the expansion of the universe itself which causes this. So the further away something is from us, the longer it takes the light to reach us and the faster it's moving away from us. And it's this key thing about it moving away from us quickly, the faster it's moving away from us, because then something happens to the light. It gets shifted. So for any wave, in fact, it doesn't have to be light wave, it also happens for sound waves. Um, if so, an object is moving away from us, things sort of get spread out. For light, that means that it gets shifted to the red end of the spectrum, we call it a red shift. If it's moving towards us, everything sort of gets squished up and it gets shifted into the blue end of the spectrum, and that's called a blue shift. In a day-to-day -day lives, our more direct experience of this is with sound waves. If you hear an ambulance coming towards you, it's got a high pitch, and then as it moves past, it shifts to a much lower pitch, and we call this the Doppler shift. So putting all of that together, the further away a galaxy is, the longer it's taken light to reach us, the faster it's moving away from us, the more it's shifted into the infrared and it tells us why web is so important. So here we're shown the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum. Light goes way beyond the small visible portion that um, our eyes are sensitive to and comes in many sort of different flavors that does uh, has different impacts um, on the world around us. And this little portion here is what the Hubble Space Telescope could see. And this whole portion here is what Webb can see. And this is a spectrum from a galaxy. So we take the galaxy and we spread it out. And there's actually some of the light gets lost because the universe gets in the way, just as the infrared light gets in the way of uh, light reaching um, the Earth. Some of the light from the galaxy gets lost on its um, journey to us through the universe. And that means that there is a certain distance at which things are moving away from us so quickly that Hubble may not be able to see them at all. And to be able to see them, we would need Webb. So how far back in time can Hubble and Webb see? For this, I wanna give you some markers. This is a clock. It's the whole history of the universe all the way back around to 13.8 billion years ago. And there's a couple of markers here. So this first dark blue segment um, is the whole history of humans in the universe, 2.8 million years. And if we go around to about the third of the age of the universe, we have the formation of the solar system and not long after it, the formation of the Earth. But we actually have to go much further back in time to around 13.6 billion years ago for one of the estimates of the formation time of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which is not that long before we think the whole of the universe formed in a giant big bang. And this marker here is showing us how far back in time Hubble could see. So it can't see any further back than 13.4 billion years or 400 million years after the Big Bang. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's most of the history of the universe. Why do we care so much about this tiny little segment? To tell you that, I want to show you a different view of the history of the universe. If we go from the Big Bang to the present day, and now we've stretched out that time period just after uh, the Big Bang. Um, there's a point in time 
where after some rapid inflation and things look very weird, um, things start to look maybe a bit more recognisable and condense out into neutral hydrogen and helium. And there's also dark matter there. Um, but there's not much else. And it's a bit boring. We call it the dark ages. There's nothing really for us to see for a little while. But what's happening is that gravity is doing its work and it's pulling matter in on itself. So little regions that were slightly denser will be getting denser and denser and regions that had less matter will be getting sparser and sparser. And it takes some time before regions can get hot enough and dense enough to ignite hydrogen fusion. And it's at this point that we have our very first generation of stars and they are built uh, just from the building blocks left over from the Big Bang, that's neutral hydrogen and helium, and we think they're huge. We think they can be up to 500 suns in mass, and we think that they burn really brightly and burn quickly and then die in huge supernova. And as soon as they die, they start spewing out heavier elements into the surrounding medium. So it's a really short period in the history, and yet we don't think we've seen them yet. So this is the marker of how far Hubble back Hubble can see, whereas NearCam can see to within 70 million years after the Big Bang. NearCam is the near infrared camera, one of the instruments on board Webb. So we think that's far enough back for us to see the first stars. We just have to be lucky. And maybe we have to sit there and stare for long enough to be able to see these very faint things. Or maybe some of the images have already seen them. But what has Hubble found in the early universe already? And what will Webb do better? So when we go off searching for these galaxies in the really early universe, it's a bit like a needle in a haystack situation. So we don't just sort of get images of single galaxies at once, we get everything. This is a very famous patch of sky, it's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And here there are 10,000 galaxies. And when we revisited this field and spent hundreds more hours, so it already had hundreds of hours with Hubble, but then we spent hundreds more staring at the same patch of sky. We found seven likely candidates inhabiting the universe less than 600 million years after the Big Bang. And this is what they look like. They're a little bit boring looking. Um, they won't look much more interesting with Webb, honestly. And there's one here where it's actually three images of the same patch of sky. You see, you don't see it, you don't see it, and then you do see it. And this here, people went back to look at it afterwards and they suspect actually it's not a super distant high redshift galaxy. It's maybe much closer to us and is masquerading as a very distant galaxy. Yet what it took Hubble hundreds of hours to do, Webb will be able to do in tens of hours. So this is the same patch of sky. And this is a simulated data of what we hope to see in October this year, when we return to this patch of sky. And if you can um, see, it depends a little bit on your screen, uh, you just start to pick out lots of uh, fainter galaxies. So Webb will find many, many more galaxies in the early universe. Another way that we find galaxies in the early universe, because they're very faint and they're far away, is to take help from, from nature. We have sort of natural magnifying glasses that we use. I'd love to play you all of this video, but I'm just going to play a snippet of it for you because it explains it really in a really lovely way. So hopefully this will load for us. I'm sitting right next to the router and everything. <laughs> okay. That's a shame. I might check and see if it loads in a in a little while. 
but I'll show you from this image. So we have regions of space where we have huge supermassive clusters of galaxies. They're so massive that they distort space-time itself and bend light from galaxies behind them. And this magnifies the galaxies so we can see fainter galaxies and it distorts them and stretches them out and we can actually see far more detail. Just one last try. Nope, it doesn't want to play. Okay. And of course, this, the reason I wanted to tell you this is because this is a, one of the first images from Webb that was released last night. I don't know if any of you sat up and waited for it. It was released more than an hour later than they said it was going to be and started off with a room of, I think, eight people here and it ended up with three at the end. Um, this, the first things that we see are these sort of spiky objects. These are stars within our own galaxy. And the shape here is produced uh, just by, uh, we call it diffraction around uh, the mirror, etc. And that shape is uh, specific to Webb. And then the next thing we see are these um, bright galaxies in the center, which are cluster galaxies 5.2 billion light years away. So when the light started traveling from them to us, it was before the formation of the sun, the Earth, the solar system. And then all of the galaxies behind them um, are getting distorted. So anything that looks really long and drawn out is more distant still. And this is allowing us to see fainter things behind it and to see all of these amazing galaxies in more detail. But without context, this is just a pretty image, right? So let me show you the comparison to Hubble. So here's Hubble and here's Webb for just a small cutout. And I've been trying to find out exactly how long the exposure time is for Hubble and I've heard different things. I've heard anything from 10 days to two days to 400 orbits. So I don't have a good answer for you, but it is at the very least four times longer than the web exposure time. So in less than quarter of the time, web is picking out so many more beautiful details for us and many more faint galaxies. So initially when I saw the image, I was like, oh gosh, that's gorgeous, but mm, I want to know how much better it is than Hubble or what else it's doing. And thankfully, some wonderful people on Twitter put some things together very quickly for us. So we don't just want to find very distant galaxies. We want to know that they are actually in the very distant universe. And our gold standard for that is spectroscopy, where we take the light and split it up. And to date, just this is the highest retrospectroscopically confirmed galaxy that we have and it's this little smear here and it was very challenging to get the spectrum i already told you that from the seven likely candidates one of them we suspect was masquerading as a high redshift galaxy but with web we have this wonderful instrument called near spec which is going to allow us to follow up all of our new candidates very quickly it can take hundreds of spectra at once and it does so with this amazing um called a micro shutter array. It's a quarter of a million teeny tiny doors, each one of which is about the width of a human hair. And we can open and close them independently of each other. So we choose which galaxies we want the light from, let it through, and it falls on a prism or a grating, and then we split up the light. And this is what it looks like. And we tend to see fingerprints of different elements. And if we only see fingerprints of hydrogen and helium, then this would be really great evidence that what we're looking at is only built from the primordial building blocks left over from the Big Bang. And today, what I wasn't expecting is that they showed us a spectrum from near spec. And I've been impatiently waiting to hear how well near spec is working because it's all been under embargo and I haven't been um, helping in the commissioning efforts. So this little tiny red smudge, 13.1 billion light years away. It's taken 13.1 billion years for the light to reach us. And here is the spectrum. And there is far more than just hydrogen and helium there. We're seeing neon and we're seeing oxygen. And we can also tell just from looking at the spectrum that it's a really 
extreme environment that is not similar to what we see in local galaxies. So this, for me, was my favourite part of um, this afternoon. And then there's a question of what galaxies Hubble may have missed. So it, we found quite a lot of galaxies in the high of universe. I told you seven in that region, but we have definitely, you know, thousands above Reggie 4 within like 1.5 billion years of the Big Bang. We have hundreds above um, less than 800 million years after the Big Bang. So we do have some quite large samples, but Hubble was always picking things out on a very specific characteristic. So I tend to end on an analogy. We're not quite ending on this analogy. There's still more at the end, but let me tell you. So let's say that I'm an alien and I want to study humans. Hubble's first view of the galaxies in the early universe would be equivalent to taking me, alien Emma, and putting me down in a primary school playground. So the first view of those galaxies, you get so much information, right? They've got heads and arms and they move this way. It's incredible amount of information, but after a while, I start asking, okay, fine, but are they all this short? Are they all this energetic? Like, are these typical humans? This is something we'd like to ask. Are the galaxies that Hubble has found already typical galaxies in the early universe? Whereas Webb would be the equivalent of taking me, Ellie and Emma and putting me down in a bustling metropolis with a huge diverse population of all ages. And we still don't fully know that Webb hasn't put us down in a city of children that Hubble has showed us the typical galaxies. So where I will end is in um, a comparison of Hubble to Webb again from that same beautiful image. And I'm going to flick back and forth between them. And I'd like you to look at what Hubble has missed. And maybe one of the galaxies that you find has evidence of the first stars. Maybe it's the highest redshift galaxy that we've seen to date. So I'm just going to keep flicking because I'm enjoying it. <laughs> there we go. With that, I'll finish. I can hear you. Hi. I think I heard that one. So why is it orbiting about L2 rather than sitting at the point itself? Um, yeah, so that's an excellent question. I don't know why the particular orbit, but the reason it orbits is because it's not really a stable point. It's not like you get there and gravity is helping you stay there. You actually need quite a lot of energy to keep it sort of at L2. So it's much easier to put it into um, an orbit around this point in space rather than try and keep it at an exact point. Mm. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about the spectra. So it's the first time we get to see what elements there are in galaxies in the early universe. So we actually have the ability with Webb to build up a story of how stars are processing that primordial hydrogen and helium and building up other elements like oxygen, nitrogen, um, neon, which we saw in that spectrum there and how it's sort of building up over cosmic time because you need those heavier elements to be able to produce dust in galaxies which is the sort of starting mechanism to be able to make planets like so much of it depends on uh, just building up your heavier element stock and we're going to be able to write that story with web uh, amazing stuff uh, yes Um, so yeah, could you talk talk a bit about a bit more about primordial stars and what the, what that means? So the primordial stars. Um, so hopefully we'll find them. I'm not sure in particular what you'd like to know, but they but in some way finding them helps us know when it all began, and. What we found so far is sometimes we find galaxies and we find them in the early universe and they look like they've been there for a while already. And that can be sometimes a little uncomfortable when you're sort of like, oh, it's around 500 million years after the Big Bang and we think it's been forming stars for 300 million years. So if we actually get to see those first points of like stars forming, then we know really when it all started and we know, you know, we can possibly sigh, <laughs> a sigh of relief that things that we know about, about when the Big Bang happened and when things started to form after that, all sort of slowed into place. Uh, yeah, question right at the back. Um, so, uh, yeah, so will any of James Webb's observations be looking at nearer things or is it all just about the very distant universe that we haven't been able to see before? So I've told you about one of the four science goals and uh, I believe you'll hear about another really important one just after this. Um, so we go from first light, the first stars and galaxies, that's one science goal. Galaxies through cosmic time, you know, just how are they forming and evolving? So if you've seen the images today, Stefan's quintet is a perfect example of that type of observation that will be instrumental. And then we go to closer to home with stellar birth and stellar death as well as exoplanets. So everything that they've released today is sort of spanning those four science goals. So yes, there's quite a lot that's looking nearby and there's quite a lot that's looking at distant universe. Wonderful. And there was a question at the front. I think there's one last question at the front. Um, the images you showed of the spectrum, I just don't think John, uh, magnificent image, does it just take the spectra of one particular part of the image or are you getting Oh, that's a great question. So this one in particular is from near spec, which has all those teeny tiny shutters. So it, it's certainly not getting spectra of the whole image, although there are some modes on different instruments that will allow you to do that. But I know that they took more than one spectrum because they've been saying on Twitter how many objects they found with some of these lines in. So I think they've taken hundreds from this from this field with near spec. For this subject and they've probably taken other things as well but absolutely amazing well let's, let's thank him again <laughs> cool thank you so much um, so yeah, so after we're going to have a five minute break um, uh, and then after that uh, we are going to have another speaker uh, who's going to tell us all about what James Webb is going to do for planets uh, which is this, an entirely new science goal, but equally exciting. So yeah, so take five minutes, meet back here, see you then.
Maybe it's just a bit quiet. I, I just go. <laughs> Callum. Callum is the one who's helping out? Uh, yeah. He said. Hello, hello, testing. Out. This works. Yes, yes good. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, so, yeah, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the final part of the evening and our. Our co-headline speaker, Professor, uh, Professor Niku Madhusudan, who is Professor of Astrophysics and Exoplanet Science uh, here at the Institute of Astronomy. He's going to be telling us all uh, about how James Webb is going to revolutionize our view of exoplanets. Thanks, Matt. Are you turning off the lights? Sir? Maybe a little bit. It's too dark, maybe. There should be something yeah, intermediate. Really right? so th this is low. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you guys want? Lights on? Second one down screen. That'd be better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's always an option. So, hello everyone. Uh, great to be here. Uh, great to see you all. Um, it would be an understatement uh, to say that uh, we are living in a very revolutionary time in the history uh, of our species, not just the generation, but of the species. And I don't uh, unmute, so it's muted. No, you can hear me. No, it's on. Um, and I don't say this, uh, yeah, it's on, I think. <laughs> so I don't uh, say this lightly at all. I really mean it. Um, and you'll see why uh, throughout my talk. Um, I was uh, just joking with my graduate students outside uh, that when I was a graduate student, that was, uh, or when I started my graduate student, that was almost 18 years ago, um, James Webb was supposed to be launched in a few years at that time. So 2008, 2010 was the date at that point, and we were all very excited that uh, as soon as a graduate, I'll get to work on JWST data. And I only had to wait another 10, 15 years. <laughs> So you can see our excitement uh, where we are today. The first uh, spectra are showing up, and uh, we get to work on it. And a lot of work, uh, pioneering work in this direction is happening here at Cambridge on how to interpret the spectra that JWST is going to get. And I'll show you some, uh, some um, simulated data on the kind of observations we will be making uh, led from here at Cambridge. So, um, so, so it's a super, um, um, it's a profound, uh, moment uh, for all of us doing the science, but also for our species in general. This is a profound moment because a telescope, I'm sure you've heard in, in the talk so far, a telescope like this uh, doesn't happen very often. It happens maybe once, once every 50 years, if that. Um, uh, and the next telescope of this magnitude won't happen until 2050. Uh, and we have all the science that uh, we can do on, uh, in, in between. So, um, um, I will not show you just pretty pictures. I'll also show you some uh, science. Uh, so bear with me if things get a little bit complicated, but I want to take you along uh, the ride. So if you don't, if you miss some of the parts, that's okay. We'll still bring the big picture together towards the, I mean, as, as we go along. But I, I want you to get the actual feel for how science is done uh, with JWST data, or will be done. Uh, I just put this background picture, which I'm sure you have seen by now. Uh, and if you just stare at it, it, if I stare at it, it boggles my mind that that's what we are actually seeing, right? It's not an artist's uh, uh, impression. And, and that's a very small, almost negligible patch of the sky. And you see the universe is teeming with galaxies and all sorts of structures. And each of those galaxies has hundreds of billions of stars. Uh, and today, we think every single star, almost every star, should have a planet around it. It's crazy to think about it, right? So which means in our own galaxy, where we expect, where, where we think there are about 100 billion stars, almost every one of them, almost, on average, should have a planet around it. And then there are hundreds of billions of galaxies like that in the universe. So. In the past, people used, used to ask me, so what do you think? Is there life elsewhere? Now, I ask you, what do you think? Right? I mean, the enormity of the situation is just mind-boggling. 
right? So it's, it's not even a well-posed question in my, my mind uh, at this point, is there life elsewhere or not? It basically doesn't matter because the universe is so vast, in my opinion, that I wouldn't be surprised if there is life elsewhere. The odds against it are so low. But if, we, if there is indeed no life elsewhere, that is also a remarkable thing about our own uniqueness in the universe. So either way you cut it, we are living in a profound uh, reality as we, as we, as we uh, are right now. So to, to have a, a, a footing to start with, uh, just, just some perspective, it's always good to look at the solar system. Now these distances from the star are not, uh, not, not to scale, uh, but the sizes roughly are. Right. So, so the this is just an artist, uh, I mean, collection of images, but put together uh, as an artist's impression. So you've got the sun, and for the longest time, our view of the solar system was the terrestrial planets, rocky planets, Earth size and smaller, are closer in to the star, to the sun, and then you've got the giant planets, the gas giants, and then the ice giants. So there is an architecture we have been taught uh, for 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 decades. Uh, um, and this is the architecture on which all knowledge about planetary science has been built uh, for, for centuries, right? But when we uh, came to exoplanets, none of this architecture was to be preserved around other stars, right? So I, there isn't enough time in the 20 minutes I'm going to spend with you this evening to go all about all aspects of exoplanets. And so I'm just picking like very few take home points here. Let's take just the planet size, the simplest thing you can measure, right? Planet size. If we look at the solar system, all the planets fall in three broad categories, the terrestrial planets, the rocky planets, right? Earth size and smaller, the ice giants about four times Earth size, uh, and then the giant planets, uh, gas giants about 10 times Earth size. So that's all, that's all we've got in the solar system. So if you went just from those planets and started theorizing about planets in the universe, you'd put all planets in the universe roughly in those three boxes. But already a decade ago, we learned, now this is an old plot. This is all a, a decade ago, right? Today, we know 5,000, uh, over 5,000 exoplanets, and there is no quantization in size. Already from this old plot from a decade ago, I'm showing for perspective, you see that that axis, the y-axis, which is size, planet size, is entirely populated. Right? So there, are, there is no quantization you see here, and even below and above. Right? So there's a vast diversity if I take just one metric, which is the planet size. Now you think of a planet and all the properties it can have, mass, radius, orbital parameters, temperature, you name it. We see such diversity across all those parameters. Right? So that, and that's just the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Right, in terms of planetary properties, the diversity in planetary properties. And even that is old news. Right? So there are a number of missions that are happening now and have happened in the past. I'm showing some of the uh, major uh, players in planet detection, which have found these thousands of planets and will find more such planets around nearby stars. And basically the take home point is that exoplanets are extremely common and extremely diverse. And what is more, the small planets, Earth size and between Earth and Neptune size, are the most abundant planets out there in the universe. I say in the universe, but all these measurements are still only in the solar neighborhood. That's a small part of, very small part of the universe. And even there, we are seeing that small planets dominate the population and they're extremely diverse and extremely abundant. Now we've got the planets, uh, thousands of them. So what is JWST gonna do? So JWST is going to usher in a new era in planetary science in the sense that it will help us understand the properties, the atmospheric properties of those planets and try to see other physical and chemical processes, probably the surface properties and if there are any connections between the surface and the atmosphere and ultimately if there is any life out there. Okay. So we go from where we are right now in knowing just the numerous planets that are out there and that they are diverse, that they are diverse in their bulk properties, to knowing how diverse are their physical and chemical processes in their atmospheres. And that's the big leap we are going to make. Right? So, that, so that's where we stand. So I'm going to boil down everything JWST is going to do in planetary science into three big questions, just as takeaway points. So if you get nothing out of this talk, this is very easy to remember. Right? 
three big questions JWST is going to help us with. How are planets formed? Right? How do these planets form and evolve right, their formation histories? Second, how do their physical and chemical processes, their atmospheric processes operate? Okay, so we want to understand if you look outside, there is the atmosphere and you have rain, you have wind and you have the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere and so on. How do this process actually operate on the vast diversity of exoplanets out there? That's what JWST will help us understand. And then finally, the big question that we're all after, the holy grail of the field, are we alone? Right? So I'm going to walk you through each of these uh, three questions and give you examples of what JWST is going to do. As, as I'm sure you're, you will be with me if I said I'm not going to be able to do justice to all these topics. It'll take, I teach a whole course uh, uh, on, on just atmospheres, and we only talk about atmospheric process, 24 lecture course. So I'm not going to answer all these things uh, in, in, 20, in, in the 15 minutes I've left, um, but, uh, but I'll give you examples. So in terms of um, the first question on plant formation and evolution, what JWST is going to look at are three complementary environments. The first is uh, transit spectroscopy, which I'll, I'll go into more detail on this, but basically these are transiting planets, preferably the planets that we discover are preferably closer to their host stars, so the, their frequency of transiting their stars is higher, so we are able to see them better, okay, or more frequently, and then the contrast for large planets are also better. So I'm, I'm going to go into more detail on that. Another category of planets that uh, we also know of are very planets that are very far from the host stars where we can directly image the planets. Because what happens is that if the planets are too close to the host star, the starlight is going to uh, overwhelm the light from the planet. So if you want to directly image, take a direct spectrum or image of the planet, you want to be, the planet to be as far as possible from the star. So that's another class of planets that JWST is also going to study. And Another complementary environment is the formation environments of these uh, planets. For example, JWST is going to look at young uh, stars and circumstellar disks around those young stars, which are birthplaces of planets. Okay? So, so, so JWST is going to do that as well. So for the purpose of this talk, given the limited time we've got, um, I'll just take this uh, example, the transiting planets, as an example and demonstrate how we are going to study uh, their formation mechanisms. Now, uh, a, a quick movie on the transit method, I think, would help here. Uh, it's, it's pretty, if you've seen transit of uh, Venus um, across the sun, it's, it's a pretty common thing. So basically, the orbital uh, plane of the planet around the star is inclined in such a way that you, the observer, can infer the planet going in front of the star. The way you do it is when the planet is not in front of the star, you just see the starlight, the brightness, and when the planet crosses in front, you see this dip in the starlight, right? Very easy. I'm going to pause that uh, movie right there. So that's, that's it. That's all, that's all there is to the transit method, is that you look at many stars and a small fraction of which have planets aligned, uh, whose orbits are aligned in such a way that you can infer the planet going in front of the star. And those are what we call as transiting planets. And that, those we already know of several thousands of such planets. So, so when, uh, when the planet goes in front, you see this little dip, but on top of this dip, which is due to the entire planet blocking, the atmosphere also adds a little bit more contribution to that dip. So I'm going to demonstrate that also in, in, a, in, a, in a second. Um, so zooming on to the transit geometry, when the planet is just in front of the, um, uh, of the star, you see a dip, as I showed in the movie, a dip in the starlight, but that dip is basically proportional. The size of that dip is proportional to the ratio of the areas of the uh, planet over the star. Simple, right? Because the planet is blocking, the circular disk of the planet is blocking the star, so it's just that ratio. The slight caveat is that if you have a slight atmosphere around the planet, that atmosphere is going to be opaque in some frequencies or wavelengths of light, and not in others, okay? Because molecules absorb in some wavelengths and, and not in others. So depending on which wavelengths those molecules absorb in, you get, this is the absorption or size of that transit depth. Depending on which wavelength the molecules absorb in, you get, you get a slight excess of absorption than others, okay? 
And it is that little bit of excess absorption is what tells us what's in the atmosphere of the planet. Okay? So to give you a sense of scale, the size of that dip is a few parts in 10,000. Okay? The technique is easy, but the signal is small. That's the problem. Which means, in order to be able to detect that dip at high confidence, you want to be able to measure fluctuations in your light at a level of few parts in 100,000. That's what these error parts are, a few parts in 100,000. Okay? So that is the entire challenge. So these are uh, observations with the Hubble Space Telescope that we have been using uh, for, for the last decade or more. Several of my students are here in the audience who work with such data all the time and with HST data. Now, what JWST is going to do is revolutionize this, uh, this technique, basically. Uh, and I'll, go, I'll show you a comparison. This is simulated observations for one particular case. And you can see that this is the quality. The previous spectrum I showed you, whenever in the rest of my talk I talk about spectra, this is what I mean, uh, is the absorption as a function of wavelength. And you see that all HST can do is measure just in this range between around one, it can go lower wavelengths as well, but in the infrared, this is all we've got, about, up to about 1.6 micron. But the power of JWST is that it's going to expand that wavelength range to well beyond, it goes even beyond five micron, it goes up to around 25 micron. But even just within that range, you can see the kind of features we can see. So that's what we're talking about. We're going to be able to see numerous other molecules at very high uh, precision. And for, for the technically minded of you, these are showing histograms of uh, the metallicities and the elemental ratios that you can derive from such observations. And it shows a comparison between what we can do with HST, which are quite broad, uh, to uh, JWST. Um, and today's uh, press release, you may have noticed, that has already given us one such spectrum. Just, just a, the first glimpse of one such spectrum, you can see this goes all the way to 2.75 micron, and they're already seeing signs of water in the spectrum. And this is just with one transit, a regular hot Jupiter, and they're already getting that. So JWST will be spending hundreds and hundreds of hours doing such observations for a wide range of planets, all the way from giant hot planets to small, uh, Earth, roughly Earth-sized planets. Okay? So I'm going to show you examples of those as well very soon. Now, what are we going to uh, do with such observations? We are going to be able to measure, uh, again, this is a slightly technical slide, these are observations with, uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope that we are going to uh, even improve upon uh, with JWST. But basically, the idea is to me measure metallicities, these abundances of water vapor, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere as a function of planet mass. And as it turns out, by making such measurements, you should be able to put constraints on how the planets formed and evolved. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to go into much more detail in that, except to say that when the planets form in the protoplanetary disks around the host stars, where they formed and how they migrated through the disk leaves an imprint on the atmospheric composition of the planet. So the big goal today in terms of planet formation is to observe these atmospheric compositions, water vapor and other chemicals, and work our way back. Right, so to reverse engineer the process and see if we can see what formation and migration processes the planet have, has come through uh, that, gives its, uh, that gives rise to its currently observed chemical composition. Um, so, so again, another technical slide uh, to uh, convey the same point. Uh, for If you want a picture, this is a cartoon of that. Uh, in a protoplanetary disk, if you form a planet here or here or how it migrated through the disk, with respect to different snow lines, is what they're called, water, CO2, and so on, snow lines in the disk, you can leave a different imprint in the carbon and oxygen sort of chemical abundance plane in the planet's uh, atmosphere. So I'll just leave it there, and if you want, if you have more questions, you can ask me later. And I said JWST is also going to uh, image uh, disks around stars, and this is just showing you a comparison uh, of one such disk, uh, former Holt. With Spitzer, this was, that's a point, uh, point 0.6 meter, I believe, a small uh, telescope, also an infrared telescope. This was an image. With HST, we had got this image, and you can see the kind of image expected with JWST. So what this is going to allow us is to precisely map out 
planet formation regions around stars and understand what are the conditions in which planets are formed and uh, if we can constrain both the uh, processes as well as the compositions of, of those planet forming environments. Um, so, so I'll leave it there, this, this big question, how do plants form and evolve? There are many ways to answer this question with JWST, and I've given you just one small glimpse of how it's going to do it by measuring chemical compositions. So let's, uh, let's get to our uh, next question, how diverse are plant reprocessed? As I said, I give a whole uh, uh, lecture course <laughs> on just this topic, so I won't be able to do justice, but this is a uh, summary plot showing all the various atmospheric processes that can happen in any atmosphere, okay? As you, this is height basically going up, but we usually plot it in terms of pressure going down. As you go up, the pressure decreases, right? Uh, and these are temperature examples of temperature profiles, and you know, in the Earth's atmosphere, you see this ozone layer, the thermal inversion happens due to the ozone layer. So different kinds of temperature profiles can happen as you go up in the atmosphere, depending on various properties of the planets and various other atmospheric processes can be in play. You know, chemical processes, dynamical processes, radiative process, all of these things are intertwined and give rise to the net chemistry and the net light you see from a planet, net spectrum you see from a planet. So how these processes operate uh, depends on which wavelength you're going to look at, ultraviolet rays, optical, or infrared. The summary of this whole plot is that if you want to look at the region in the atmosphere where all the action happens, the actual chemistry, chemical process happen, uh, the dominant chemical process that's in this re main region here, which is where you need infrared radiation to probe that deep. That's where you probe molecules. And that's exactly what JWST is going to do. Right? With HST, we were able to use one molecule, water vapor, basically, to probe down. But there are numerous other molecules which JWST will be able to use as tracers of these numerous atmospheric processes. Okay. So I'll just list what I've said here, all the various processes that can be studied, clouds, atmospheric dynamics, chemical process, and so on. Uh, so so when, we, when people talk about JWST is going to revolutionize exoplanet science, this is what they're talking about. Imagine taking a planet around a star thousands of light years away and, and understanding all the processes or most many of the processes that are happening in the atmosphere of the planet that you don't actually see. Right? The only way we are inferring the planet is through the fluctuations in the starlight. And JWST is going to understand all this process just from those fluctuations without actually ever seeing the planet. Right. So it's mind-boggling to think about, but it's, it's the reality we are confronted with right now. Um, so I'll, I'll take you right to the frontier now. Um, in all this, so we are going to study these things for all kinds of planets, from giant planets to small planets. But what is bubbling at the very frontier of the field is what is known as the sub-Neptune regime. When I showed you this, uh, the radius uh, quantization very early on, I also showed you that there are no planets in the solar system between Earth and Neptune in size, right? Whereas when you look at exoplanet demographics, the population of exoplanets, that's exactly the region where exoplanet population dominates, okay? And that's the sub-Neptune regime. So this, is, this region is where exoplanets populate, and also there is substructure within that regime. There are two camps of planets of different sizes, one around 1.4 micron, the peak. This is just a distribution of planets. Another around two micro, uh, two sorry, two Earth radii, and one is around 1.3, 1.4 Earth radii. So there are these two camps of planets, and we today it's a big open question: which of these planets are bigger versions of Earths or super Earths, and which of these planets are smaller versions of Neptune or mini Neptunes? It's a very natural question to ask, right? But that's a big un unanswered question in the field right now. And JWST might be able to give us the first glimpses in answering that question because we are going to learn about their atmospheric compositions. And if you look at Earth or the terrestrial planets and Neptune, the atmospheric compositions are vastly different, right? The terrestrial planets are dominated by carbon dioxide or nitrogen or oxygen and so on, whereas Neptune is hydrogen rich. The only way to tell whether a planet is a super Earth or a mini Neptune is to get its atmospheric composition. So JWST, again, is going to revolutionize this frontier um, in the field. I'm just giving you an example of, of what kind of data will be obtained. This is a data set with, uh, obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope, okay? just one spectrum. The, the solid curves here are our models, theoretical models, and the points with error bars are the data. So you see that's the NHST spectrum. 
and there are photo, a few broadband points with other facilities. For the same amount of observing time, JWST will be able to get this kind of spectrum all the way from almost optical to 10 micron. Can you imagine that? This is all within 0.7 micron, and now you've got a 10 micron wide spectrum. And you go from measuring just water to possibly measuring a wide range of other species. Right? So just on the face of it, just by the wavelength coverage, it's revolutionary in the kind of molecules you're going to get. And this is a habitable zone planet. The temperature, atmospheric temperatures of this planet, of this planet would be similar to what we've got here on Earth. So just imagine measuring all these molecules in these planets. I told you I'll go a bit more technical. So if you don't get something from this plot, you're fine. The point is, this is a chemistry plot. If you do chemistry for this atmosphere, theoretical calculations, you expect all kinds of molecules uh, from water vapor, CO, methane, uh, ammonia, and so on, depending on various, uh, you know, the radiation level and so on, obviously. But if you have a surface in the planet, like a liquid surface or a solid surface, it's going to change the chemistry dramatically. Right? So if it's a sub-Neptune, if it's a Neptune-like planet with a hydrogen-rich atmosphere, you see all this complicated chemistry happening. But the moment you have a surface in the planet at one bar, it cuts out a lot of that chemistry because it, it breaks the chemical equilibrium cycle that is recycled from below. Okay? And then you end up with a different composition. So there are tracers. If you, if you run the story backward, what this is saying is that the atmospheric composition is a tracer for the presence of a surface and the type of surface that's present at the bottom and what kind of interactions are happening between the surface and the atmosphere. Again, remarkable, right? We're talking about a small planet, a habitable zone planet, a temperate planet, and a planet that we don't actually see. And now we are saying we'll try to see if it's got a surface in it. And then that's what JWST will let us do. Again, like these are the data quality, again, simulated data. This is not a mini Neptune now. This is even smaller. We're going to literally Earth-sized planets. And these are simulated observations. Uh, so this, the top one is for a giant planet for comparison. But the bottom is for transit planets around small stars. These are M dwarf stars, which are about a tenth of tenth to 0.2 times uh, solar radius. Uh, we can simulation show that we can also measure secondary atmospheres, like water or CO2 or uh, nitrogen-rich atmospheres can also be detected uh, with JWST. I mean, nitrogen itself is not detectable, but heavy atmospheres can also be probed uh, with, James, with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, uh, and the, there are lots of observations also planned for magma ocean worlds. These are worlds where the entire surfaces would be molten. And there are planets out there, believe it or not. We don't have those in the solar system. But there are planets out there which are so hot that the entire rock on the surface would be molten. And then that kicks in a different kinds of chemistry in the atmosphere, which can also be observed with JWST. So there are planned observations for that as well. And not only that, you can also actually do thermal mapping of the surface of these planets. Believe it or not, there are observations being planned of that kind as well, in that you have a rocky planet around a small star and with JWST, you can look at the planet as it's going around the star and try to reconstruct the brightness temperature distribution on the surface of the planet. Right. So if this is not revolutionary, I don't know what is. <laughs> so, so I told you all about uh, atmospheric uh, uh, processes, and I'm running out of time. Uh, but I have your favorite question, what do you want? So <laughs> I, will, I will take a, just a couple of minutes to, to answer the big question we've got in the room. Are we alone? Um, now, uh, in order to answer, this is a, a fundamental question that has uh, occupied uh, the minds of our species for millennia. Uh, but you can break down that question into three broad parts, um, subparts. In order to establish are we alone, we have to establish what kind of planets are actually habitable. Right, to begin with. And then if, they are, if there are planets that are habitable, then what do we expect to see that would tell us that it's a biosignature that we are seeing, that the planet is actually inhabited? And then the last question is what is relevant to us here is that can JWST actually look at such biosignatures? Right? So there, are, there is a whole hierarchy. I mean, the question is grand so and, and complex. So there is a whole hierarchy of questions we need to answer. I won't answer the first two questions right here. Those are theoretical questions, but I'll get right to the point on what JWST actually can do. Right? 
So if we look at uh, habitable planets, just for some perspective, this is called the habitable zone, which means the distance, this gray region here is the distance from the star where you need to be, where your planet needs to be for the surface to be, to have liquid water, right? So that region will be closer to the star, the smaller and cooler the star is for, for obvious reasons. Now, today we know of, uh, and we don't know of an exact Earth analog around a Sun-like star. There are various missions that are trying to find that and will do in the future. But what we do know are of several planets in the habitable zones of M dwarfs. I mentioned this earlier, small stars, which are about a tenth to a half uh, solar uh, size. And then th these planets can be much closer to the star and, and be in the habitable zone. And one example of that is what is known as the TRAPPIST-1 system, um, as some of you may have heard of. And you see the entire inner solar system uh, be, within Mars uh, is of the same dimension as the entire TRAPPIST-1 system. Okay, So you've got about four habitable planets within the orbit of Mars in this system. And that is possible only because the star is small and cool. Okay. So, so if you look at the spectrum of Earth, and people have done this obviously from, from space, uh, and this is what it looks like. You expect to see oxygen, uh, ozone, and so on, and also the top species, water vapor, uh, CO2, and so on. But it's less trivial, um, so, sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's non-trivial uh, to uh, uh, exactly say what is a bio, what would qualify of those molecules would qualify as a biosignature. Because a lot of these molecules, we know that life gives out on Earth, for example, water vapor, but uh, you would never call it a biosignature because the ocean has water in it, can give water vapor, right? So that's an example of a false positive, right? Life can give it, but there are other processes that can also give it. So detecting it wouldn't be an, a, 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 a robust measure of life. So, so there are various studies that do this thing called biosignature assessment of various molecules. Uh, it's reasonably safe to say that for an Earth-like planet or a Sun-like star, you know, ozone or oxygen uh, and maybe to some extent methane and nitrous oxide are good indicators of life. But people are also saying that if you have other stellar type like M dwarf, the same molecules can occur in other ways. Okay, so it's not clear what is a biosignature right now. On the other hand, there are various other uh, chemicals that are produced in small quantities, these are called secondary metabolic byproducts, which, which are more favorable sources for life, for more favorable signatures of life. So what we are going to look for in this, when we are in search of life elsewhere, uh, are spectroscopic signatures like this of various molecules, and then piece together that information after their detection to see if those indicate something about life. So I think that is a reasonable uh, approach to proceed with, rather than focusing on just one molecule and looking for it, right? We need to build a sort of a context. So if we do that and we get to our punchline question, can JWST actually detect a biosignature? I'm going to give you the answer right away. If we are talking about finding a biosignature in an Earth-like planet or a Sun-like star, the answer is no. Sorry. So, so we are not going to, going to be able to do it with JWST. And there are missions being planned for 30 years from now and uh, to do that. However, uh, that's not to say that JWST can't find biosignatures in exoplanets. And the key is again, the small stars, the M dwarfs, right? So there are simulations that have been done, which show that if you have tens of, if you observe tens of transits of these planets, especially these TRAPPIST-1 planets around its host star, then it is possible to find something like ozone in its atmosphere. So there is that ray of hope, and there are several JWST observations already planned to do just that. And JWST has got a lifetime of at least 10 years now. So it is plausible that over these 10 years, if you look enough, one can actually detect something like ozone or methane uh, in the atmospheres of these rocky planets around, uh, around M dwarfs. And of course, there are there are other uh, theories that are being float that have been floated recently, which is to say that why are we restricting ourselves to Earth, like literally Earth-sized planets? Why can't these planets be slightly bigger? Which, as you know from my slide on the transit uh, signature, if you increase the planet, the signal will increase, right? So in recent years, um, and this is work led from here, uh, we have also been arguing that your planets can be slightly bigger 
than Earth and can still have habitable conditions. And you may have heard in the news things like Haitian worlds. This is this is this is the concept: is that these planets would be ocean-covered worlds and without any rocky surface, which means their radius will be bigger than just rocky planets. And if you have hydrogen-rich atmospheres, that combination, the planet being bigger and the atmosphere being lighter, allows you to make this at would allow you to make these atmospheric detections with James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so this is a cartoon of such a planet. It would have like a rocky core, a water, a, a, an ocean layer, and a hydrogen layer on top. And it's possible that if you have a, an atmosphere like that, it's detectable with JWST. I'll show you just some simulations here. This is my last slide. Some of the simulations show that for slightly bigger planets, about two times bigger planets uh, than Earth, with hydrogen-rich atmospheres, it is possible to detect biosignatures if they're indeed um, inhabited. Right, uh, so so that is how far JWST will get us in terms of biosignature detections. Maybe these Trappist one type planets with a lot of time investment, or hydrogen rich atmospheres that are also habitable with lesser amount of observing time. So so over the next decade, there will be several observations made of these kinds of planets. So so we'll have to see what we find. So, so I uh, wrap up here with my final slide, bringing it all together. So uh, I hope I have shared with you my excitement on what JWST, the big advances JWST will make in answering all these three uh, big questions. And yet everything I've told you is only a small section of what JWST will actually do. Um, uh, but but you, get the, you get the flavor for how important, uh, how important uh, the times we live in uh, are. Okay. So I leave you with that and take any questions. Stay tuned. Um, so I will, just before we do any questions, I will say uh, we have some sort of drinks and nibbles uh, for you as well. So maybe if we do a couple of questions and then if you uh, don't mind staying afterwards, we can yeah. just continue the questions uh, with a couple of drinks. Um, you you wanna? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for a comprehensive whistle stop tour with such complex slides. And three questions. What Same three. Or? <laughs> with the water signature on the Super Jupiter, and uh, when you, with the hydrogen atmosphere. Second question. Uh, sorry, sorry. The first question was the. The slide you have of the uh, water signature yeah. on the Super Jupiter from J from S two. Yeah. Uh, second question, I have an image on my wall of Fomalhaut B. Is it a planet? And um, I'll stop there. Okay, the first, the first one. The third one is, I'll be your slide to be available afterwards. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the question is yes, the answers are yes and yes to the first two questions. Uh, the, okay. So the formal halt B, I think, yeah. So that's the current understanding anyway, is that it is a, a planet. The, uh, for the first question, it is water vapor in a hydrogen-rich atmosphere, like Jupiter. Water, water vapor uh, in a hydrogen-rich atmosphere. Uh, and I mean, in, in, so that's like Jupiter in the solar system, except Jupiter is so cold that you can't actually see water vapor so easily because it, all the water is condensed and buried deep in the atmosphere. So you actually have to send a probe into the atmosphere. Whereas these hot Jupiters are so hot that water is just in vapor form. So, and to your uh, third question, uh, maybe because some of these slides, uh, you know, they're, they have proprietary information, so it can be arranged. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, we'll do one, one question, then we'll go and uh, continue it. Mm -hmm. Maybe <laughs> like maybe two. <laughs> but go on. Yeah, it's, it is uh, competitive. Uh, so every year, these are called cycles, and this happens for all telescopes. So every year, there will be a call for proposals. So the whole international community proposes the science it wants to do. Like every team like proposes what science they want to do with the telescope, and it goes into a competition. It, it's, it's, a big, it's, it's a big event. It happens every year at Space Telescope uh, Science Institute uh, in, in, in the US, uh, where where it's decided which of those programs win time. And it's very competitive. And so they want- Is that allocated in proportion to the investment that went into the program? No, no, it has nothing to do with uh, investment proportions. It's all free, uh, free competition. It's purely based on science, scientific excellence. 
can take me one more question? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, you know, you observed some of the questions I had, actually. I was just going to ask about some of the modeling for the symbol light and spectra. Um, I was just wondering, in the event that James Webb found <coughs> um, a, a blood planet within the habitable zone, which um, closely matched uh, one of the simulated spectra, whether it would constitute proof of finding the possibility of life on an Earth like planet, yeah. or whether it would um, really um, identify a planet for further observation. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the latter. Uh, it's very hard currently to go to claim a life detection with just one molecular uh, detection uh, because of all the false positives I mentioned. You know, life gives out various molecules, but a number of those molecules can also come from various other physical processes just from the planet, right, geological or atmospheric processes. So to break those false positives is a big challenge. So you want multiple tracers and then piece together a story uh, based on those molecules. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, so let's thank uh, Matthew again. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, like if we have some, uh, some drinks and nibbles out in the lobby uh, for the next 20 minutes or so. So yeah, come and join us and continue talking about science. You happy? <laughs> Amazing. Amazing stuff. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It goes without saying. It goes without saying you're very good at this, right? I mean, that was spectacular.